Femininity by Susan Brown Miller, Chapter 3, Clothes. <clears throat> Who would deny that dressing feminine can be quite creative? A woman with a closet full of clothes for different moods and occasions is an amateur actress and a wily practitioner of the visual arts. A grand sense of theater reposes on that rack of hangers, offering a choice of imaginative roles from sexy vixen to old-fashioned romantic lady. Children of both sexes love to play dress up in their mother's costumes, complete with lipstick, handbag, and high heels, because they adore the game of let's pretend. Feminine clothing induces the body to stunt out about in small restraint, yet show offy ways. Feminine clothing produces its special feminine sounds, the staccato clickety-click of the heels, the musical jangle of bracelets, the soft rustle of silk, or, in an earlier era, the whisper of petticoats, the snap of a fan. And the finishing touches, the makeup and perfume, create a distinctive, sweet, feminine smell. And then, there are the compliments, the ultimate reward from, from men, who, for men, are known to be highly appreciative when a man... When a woman has taken the trouble to create an entire human being who looks, acts, and smells so different from them. Every wave of feminism has foundered on the question of dress reform. I suppose it is asking too much of women to give up their chief outward expression of the feminine difference, their continuing reassurance that men, to men and to themselves, that a male is a male because a female dresses and looks and acts like another sort of creature. Dressing in the 50s meant a commitment to white gloves. Worn with a strand of cultured pearls, they represented impeccable refinement and upward mobility. From Elsie de Wolf, the socialite decorator who became Lady Mendel, to Grace Kelly of Philadelphia, who became a Hollywood star and married the Prince of Monaco, the little white glove stood for class. Naturally, one needed many pairs for carrying the morning paper to work, wreak havoc on the pristine whiteness. Walking to the office was also excessively stressful to the de rigueur shoe, with its narrow pinched toe and spindly heel that almost invariably got stuck in a sidewalk grating. Accessories were important in the 50s and 60s, for they added formal grace and notes to the basic dress, with its hemline adjusted precisely to the middle of the calf, precisely to the knee, precisely to the mid-thigh, with nervous attention to Eugenia Shepherd. Of undergarments, too, there had to be a proper complement. Wired bras, backless bras, full slips, half slips, elastic girls with garter tabs, and a drawer inevitably stuffed with snagged and mismatched nylon stockings. Along with many others, my conversion to pants at the start of the 70s was slow but complete, accompanied by a sense of relief and relaxation. When blue jeans became the emblem of hip sophistication, I didn't understand I was riding a very short wave. Suddenly, it was all right to wear pants. Then it became a feminist statement to wear pants. Never again would most women wear skirts. I thought, in the way that friends of mine have thought that the revolution was just around the corner. And here it is, well into the 80s, and a woman who wears nothing but pants is a holdout, a stick in the mud, a fashion reactionary with no sense of style. My exile from the world of fashionable might be easier to bear if some of those closest to me hadn't become backsliders, apologizing for the slide with the argument that they need to wear skirts for their careers because it is, after all, still a man's world and they are but feminists in it. I would never underestimate the value of a skirt and of skirts and dresses as effective camouflage for those who fear that their femininity or their politics may be open to questions. But I do believe that's the I don't believe that's the entire story. <clears throat> I think my friends returned to dresses because they felt that life was getting gray without some whimsical indulgence in the feminine aesthetic. They missed their frivolous gaiety of personal adornment. They missed the public display of vulnerability and sexual flirtation. And they missed the promised change in appearance that a new dress, and only a new dress, can hold. Some of them had thrived on the news newsiness of fashion, the keeping up, the competition. They longed to try the current look. Some of them longed to show off their legs again, and some of them, I know, missed shopping. 
On bad days, I mourn my old dresses. I miss the graceful flow of fabric, the gentle gathered shapes and pretty colors. Straight-legged pants are boring. One cannot take on a new identity by changing trousers. Then why do I persist in not wearing skirts? Because I don't like this artificial gender distinction. Because I don't wish to start shaving my legs again. Because I don't want to return to the expense and aggravation of nylons. Because I will not reacquaint myself with the discomfort of feminine shoes. Because I'm at peace with the freedom and comfort of trousers. Because it costs a lot less to wear nothing but pants. Because I remember how cold I used to feel in the winter wearing a short skirt and sheer stockings. Because I can still call to mind the ugly looks of splattered rain, rainwater on the back of my exposed legs. Because I recall the anguish of an unraveled hem. Because I remember resenting the enormous amount of thinking I used to pour into superficial upkeep concerns. And because the nature of feminine dressing is superficial in essence. Even my objections seem superficial as I write them down. But that is the point. To care about feminine fashion, and to do it well, is to be obsessively involved in inconsequential details on a serious basis. There is no relief. To not be involved is to risk looking eccentric and peculiar, or sloppy and uncared for, or mannish and man-hating, or all of the above. Who said that clothes make a statement? What an understatement that was. Clothes never shut up. They gabble on endlessly, making their intentional and unintentional points. It is written in Deuteronomy that, quote, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto the men, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, end quote. And the reason given refers to the strongest displeasure of the highest authority. Failure to abide by a sex-distinctive dress code is, quote, an abomination unto the Lord thy God, end quote. Why should the Lord have cared so intensely about clothes? Was it to keep the sexes firmly apart and discourage promiscuity? Was it to reinforce the homosexual taboo? Was it a way of saying that women were not to be soldiers and that warriors were not to sneak about in women's clothing as a ruse to fool the enemy? I've read these different explanations, and while they all may apply to some extent, they avoid the basic point. Naked as he created them, Adam and Eve would not be mistaken. Dressed in fig leaves and animal skins after they came to no shame, their gender differences were partially obscured. A sex-distinctive dress, clothes, dress code, a loincloth for Adam, a, a sarong for Eve, a striped tie for Adam, a pair of high heels for Eve, created an emblematic polarity that satisfied a societal need for unambiguous division, neat categories, and stable order. When a child is asked by its parents whether the naked person in the picture is a man or a woman, and the child replies, I can't tell because they're not wearing clothes, the joke is really quite profound. In a clothed culture, the eye depends on artificial externals for its visual cues. When the cues are absent or conflicting, the psychological disturbance in the observer can be enormous. A blurring of the sartorial signposts can inspire hostility and rage. To mistake a man for a woman, or vice versa, is dangerous. An entire range of responses may be inappropriately misdirected. One's own sexual identity may be thrown into confusion. For how can we know who we are unless we are fairly certain who the other is? 
Skirts and pants stand juxtaposed as the Western world's symbolic great divide. A traveler who does not speak a word of a foreign language can locate the male or female restroom in an international airport by seeking out a recognizable logo. A painted stick figure with a triangular skirt leads unquestionably to the women's lounge. A stick figure without a skirt is where the men should enter. I, in my pants, am grateful to know where to go, to the door with the skirt. Am I? Is the world prepared for the real basics? Stick figures without a triangular penis? Or with or without a triangular penis? Signposts with a pair of circular breasts? A New Jersey Now, National Organization of Women, chapter, once commissioned an educational poster showing boys and girls playing a friendly, equal game of softball. But the artist couldn't figure out how to illustrate the concept unless she put the girls in skirts or in pigtails and ribbons. In, a certain remote, sorry, in certain remote parts of the globe, where people are not completely influenced by Western values, trousers still carry a sex-free neutrality, similar to the robes and tunics worn by ancient Mayans and the Greeks. And, of course, there is the fiercely, fiercely nationalistic Scotsman who doggedly hangs onto his ceremonial kilts. But there is no point in stressing the exceptions. To the Western mind, the grouping of men in trousers and women in skirts is something akin to a natural order. As basic as, as basic to the covenant of masculine feminine difference as the short hair, long hair proposition. Trousers are practical. They cover the lower half of the body without nonsense and permit the freest of natural movements. And therein lies their unfeminine danger. Bifurcation describes the phenomenon of forking or splitting, but in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, it was a euphemism for their pair of legs that women were not supposed to admit they possessed. Women's legs, or limbs, the latter term was more polite, was not, were not perceived as an anatomical arrangement for supporting the body and for walking, but, but as a blatant arrow that pointed the way to the seat of sex and other functions. Men might display their legs with nonchalance, but from pulpit and press there was a unanimous agreement that the sight of a bifurcated woman was immodest, ungodly, and sinful. The only way to avoid bifurcation was to wear a long skirt that brushed to the floor. As with most things they, that are categorized as masculine or feminine, it is impossible to separate long-standing concepts of sexual morality from long-standing concepts of aesthetic and fashion. Once both sexes wore fairly similar robes and tunics, but even in Greece and Rome, Men customarily displayed their bare legs under a tunic that came to the knees, while women wore a longer, fuller drape. Leafing through illustrated histories of European costume and fashion, which, need we be reminded, are chiefly a record of what the upper class wore, it is amusing to note that during the Middle Ages, men of nobility proudly showed off their muscular, shapely legs, sometimes augmented by padded stockings, while women appeared to have no legs at all. In fact, as wearing apparel was refined and embellished over a period of several hundred years, men's clothes were cut to show off their legs and thighs, and they were joined at the crotch, while women's clothes hid the legs and revealed some portion of the upper body, arms, shoulders, throat, and sometimes even the breasts. A tight-fitted bodice and a long flowing skirt was the standard feminine silhouette. Straight-cut long pants, the modern pair of trousers, came into fashion for men at the beginning of the 19th century to replace the customary knee breeches and stockings. The male retained his bifurcated masculinity, a matter of pride as well as comfort, but the shape of his legs was no longer on view. When skirts broke the, length, the floor length barrier in the 1920s, the historic reversal was complete. Now women's legs were on public display, a distinctive new sign of the feminine. The evolution from long skirts to short in the 1920s was an important advance in the history of women's rights. By a cut of the scissors in a dressmaker salon, women were able to walk and move with greater freedom than they had been allowed for centuries. Gone was the dragging weight of several layers of petticoats and yards of heavy fabric that swirled around the ankles. 
were thrown aside in a single stroke of fashion. From breast to thigh, the torso was liberated from the restraining corset. But the transformation of women's legs from a body part that was hidden in modesty to a glamorous appendage that was whistled at and admired may not have been a remarkable gain. Both extremes of fashion derived from a belief in the seductive nature of female sexuality, and both sought to minimize the true function of legs. <clears throat> a major purpose of femininity is to mystify or minimize the functional aspect of a woman's mind and body that are indistinguishable from a man's, or our legs have borne the brunt of this more than we care. Sorry, and our legs have borne the brunt of this more than we may care to acknowledge. Quentin Bell makes the point in his discourse on human finery that voluminous hoop skirts in the 1860s made it close to impossible for a lady to climb a narrow staircase, while hobble skirts in the 1880s were so tight that she may have she she was even more poorly equipped to mount a steep flight of steps. One hundred years later, mini skirts presented a similar problem, but in our but in our day the inhib the inhibition was a matter of exposure. What a voyeur might see from his vantage point down below. A man I had some political dealings with once challenged me by questioning why my pants had a fly front. I hadn't actually thought about that before. When I was a teenager and never wore pants except for a pair of dungarees that I rolled mid-calf, women's slacks always zippered up the side or back. I imagine today's designers feel that pants simply fit better with a front close but I hadn't given two seconds worth of thought to the meaning behind the fly until I was challenged by somebody who obviously felt it was a great, it had great meaning to him as a facilitator of sex and urination. Did he suppose I was pretending to have a penis? Few women are reluctant to wear pants because they don't believe they have the right to wear a fly front. Some think they are too tall or might be mistaken for a man from the rear, and some think they are too broad in the beam for a pair of pants to ju do justice to their figure. There is no doubt that since most of the rear ends were accustomed to viewing in pants belong to men, and most of these are covered by boxy jackets, a woman with broad full hips will think she looks better, even gracefully voluptuous, in a nice old-fashioned sense, when she puts on a skirt. To the modern mentality, grace in pants does seem to be sorry, does seem to require a slender rear end. A skirt, any skirt skirt has a feminizing mission that goes beyond the drawing of a polite yet teasing shade over the female crotch and its functions, and of flattering or draping the rear end and stomach with graceful folds. Expensive, casual body gestures, sorry, expansive, casual body gestures are characterized as immodest and unfeminine when practiced by a woman, and skirts restrict those large free movements. One does not stride. One is perpetually reminded to be circumspect when sitting or bending down. Whatever its length and however wide, the open-endedness of a skirt cannot help but guide the body into a set of conservative poses and smaller gestures, and the traditional feminine accessories that went with a skirt in the earlier era, corset, fan, muff, parasol, and shawl, and the shoes and pocketbooks of today have always reinforced those restrictions. But of course, feminine clothing was never has never been designed to be functional, for that would be a contradiction in terms. Functional clothing is a masculine privilege, and practicality is a masculine virtue. To be truly feminine is to accept the handicap of restraint and restriction, and to come to adore it. Magnificent garments in the late Middle Ages were intentionally designed to immobilize the royal personage who wore them as such as to impress the lower orders with their visual drama for elaborate hampering clothes were proof that royal desires were served by the labor of others. A billowing sleeve, an immense white ruff, a luxurious layer of fur and embroidered jewel-encrusted fabric were status symbols for kings and their courtiers, even more than for queens and their ladies. A nobleman's cloak was often more splendid than his wife's. A male plumage became such a giddily competitive venture that in order to preserve the boundaries of class, Sumptuary laws were enacted periodically throughout Western Europe to allocate the wearing of silk, sable, velvet, and threads of gold and silver by rank and station. So many robes for a baron, so many yards for a knight, etc. 
Allotments for wives and daughters were added to the later codes as someone, sorry, as something of an afterthought. Under the energizing momentum of political revolution, industrial progress, and a burgeoning middle class, a change in attitude toward clothing began to take place in the late 18th century. Immobilizing garments and uncomfortable accessories were out of step with the fast-moving times. Elegant menswear began its steady advance toward functional utility and even adapted some practical ideas from the working woman's wardrobe. Gentlemen began to wear clothes that reflected the new masculine values of dynamic action combined with serious responsibility, expressed through expert tailoring and practical dark colors. Class distinctions were maintained not by frilly impediments and ostentatious displays, but by a new subtle standard of good cloth and good fit. No such fundamental change, however, took place for the woman. While the design of men's clothes was streamlined and de democratized to reflect the vigorous efficiency of the soot-footed age of industrialization, the design of women's clothes did not move forward at all. Although the Industrial Revolution employed the labor of working-class women in factories and mills, it also produced the middle-class lady of leisure, with her staff of household servants and her strictly refined feminine sphere, a sphere whose parameters were motherhood, social and moral refinement, and gracious adornment of her husband's life and home. Throughout the 19th century, Hoops, crinolines, bustles, sorry, bustles and trains come and go. Taste and color might veer and shift. The width of the skirt, the swell of the sleeve, the location of the waist, and the shape of the bust might vary with considerable imagination from season to season. But the woman of fashion remained a perishable confection, a wedding cake vision of conspicuous consumption, whose impractical clothes reflected the aristocratic values of, our, of centuries past. And she had no followers more attractive or more eager to become the perfect lady than the idle wives and daughters of the newly moneyed bourgeoisie with their newly acquired aspirations and pretensions and their newly acquired laundresses and lady maids. In material terms, Ill-paid laborers in the mills, including children, worked day and night to spin out the yardage. Sewing machines were introduced to, automat to automate the stitching. This meant the piling on of ruffles, ribbons, flounces, piping, fringes, tassels, lace, beads, and bows, and the numerous starch petticoats to bedeck and adorn a sedate and artificially modeled figure. Perhaps one season of, of crinoline, sorry, one season, a crinoline cage might replace the petticoats, or perhaps a hobbled skirt might replace the hoop, to be replaced in turn by a bustle or train. Whatever the innovation, the latest feminine mode was usually expressed through the fashion language of a period of a period revival. A pattern of looking backward continued to shape the design and marketing of women's clothes in the 20th century. New styles regularly owe their inspiration to historic costumes and the bringing back is happily acknowledged. Be it Dior's new look, of 1947, which brought back long skirts, crinolines, and the waist cincher, the imperial Russian peasant look of Saint Laurent in 1976, which brought back frogging, piping, and heel boots, the frankly named 1940s retro look a year or so later, which brought back slit skirts, shoulder pads, and bright red lipstick, or Ralph Lauren's Victorian look of the 1980s. Except for the geometric space age designed of Courage and Mary Quant in the turbulent mid-60s, white vinyl boots and miniskirts, new clothes and shoes for women are trumpeted each season as yet another return to femininity. By contrast, fashions for men change very little from year to year, and they never look back either for inspiration or as a selling technique. A return to masculinity is an unthinkable concept, for masculine is defined by the present sense, but in clothes, in attitude, and in everything else, to be safely feminine, to retain her femininity, 
A woman must look to the distant past. Given the striking divergence in purpose between men and women's fashions, It is no wonder that the creative design centers took root and flourished in different places. Men looked toward London, the somber city of banking and mercantile commerce, with its cautious, responsible tailors of Savile Row, or Savile Row. Women cast their covetous eyes towards Paris, the thrillingly wicked citadel of romance and art, with its exotic perfumes, its fanciful dressmakers, and ingenious corsetiers. Although there was more than a symbolic connection between the suffocating confinements of women's long skirts and the suffocating restrictions that refined a woman's roles and dress reform from the 1950s, dress reform movement of the 1950s became excruciatingly personal torment and a political mortification to the American heroines of women's rights. All told, not more than 100 suffragettes dared to appear in public wearing quote unquote the rational dress as it came to be known in health and hygiene circles. Among the pioneers were Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, the Grimke sisters, and the self-effacing Quaker organizer Susan B. Anthony, who later recalled this time in her life as, quote-unquote, a mental crucifixion. It was popularly named the Bloomer costume because Amelia Bloomer, a Seneca Falls neighbor of Mrs. Stanton took up the cause in, paid, in the pages of her reformist newspaper, The Lily, and because Bloomer sounded so ridiculous and funny, but the suffragists simply called it the short dress, and they were punctilious about giving credit where credit was due to Mrs. Stanton's cousin, Elizabeth Smith Miller, the daughter of abolitionist Garrett Smith. Mrs. Miller's creation, which she had originally stitched up for working in the garden, had a somewhat Turkish look. The lower part consisted of a pair of ankle-length pantaloons with an outward skirt that came to the knees. To the knees! No trailing skirts to get caught underfoot, stepped on, ripped, or soiled. No undulating petticoats to gather up and hold with dainty grace while turning a corner or sitting down. In order to avoid a mishap, in order to avoid a mishap, On a visit to Seneca Falls, Lizzie Miller gave Lily Stanton a practical demonstration. She showed her cousin how confidently she could walk up a flight of stairs with a baby in her arms and an oil lamp balanced in her other hand without fear of tripping. Mrs. Stanton, who already had four of her seven children, was instantly converted. With abounding enthusiasm for which she was famous, she applied the scissors and needle to her own long skirts and began to evangelize along among her many friends, in suffrage and abolition. Offering to make a present of the short dress to Susan Anthony, a promising new ally from the temperance movement, Miss Anthony replied that she would never put it on. Quote, We are like the poor fox in the fable, having cut off his tail, end quote, Mrs. Stanton wrote to her cousin. Quote, We can have no peace in traveling unless we cut off the great national petticoat. Stand firm, end quote. There are many exhortations, sorry, there are many exhortations from one feminist to another in the years 1951 and 1952 to stand firm. Wrote Ida Huston Harper, quote, The dress howled in derision, the pulpit hurled its anathemas, and the rabble took up the refrain. On the streets of the larger cities, the women were followed by mobs of men and boys, who jeered and yelled and did not hesitate to express their disapproval by throwing sticks and stones, end quote. Many a vote for women rally turned into a circus when an unruly mob invaded the hall to gawk at the bloomers. What began as a personal convenience had turned into a painful political principle, the rights of a woman to wear comfortable clothes. In December 1952, while visiting with Mrs. Stanton, Susan B. took the plunge, shortening her skirt and cutting her hair to make a total statement, quote, well, at least I am in a short skirt and trousers, end quote. She anxiously wrote to Lucy Stone. She was the last of the great suffragists to adopt the style. Within one year, 
she would be among the last to still wear it. Despite the support of her husband and father, who believed that dress reform was the key to women's emancipation, Elizabeth Smith Miller lowered her skirts with each passing season. She wore some variation of her Turkish costume for seven years, as did Amelia Bloomer. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's bloomers became an unpleasant issue in her husband's campaign for the state senate, inspiring a bit of verse from the opposition. Quote, 20 tailors take 20 stitches. Mrs. Stanton wears the breeches. End quote. Her son, Neil, wrote from school, begging his mother not to wear the short dress when she came to visit. In less than two years, Mrs. Stanton capitulated. She let down her hems and urged her movement forward to full retreat. Writing to Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone, quote, I know that you... Sorry, I know what you must suffer in consenting to bow against the tyranny of fashion, but I also know what you must suffer among fashionable people in wearing the short dress. And so, not for the sake of the cause, not for any sake but your own, take it off, end quote. Anthony and Stone conferred quickly by letter. From Stone, quote, I have bought a nice new dress, which I have had for a month, <clears throat> and it is not made because I can't decide whether to make it short or long. Not that I can think any cause will suffer, but simply to save myself a great deal of annoyance and not feel when I am a guest in a family that they are mortified in other if other persons happen to come in. I was at Lucretia Mott's a few weeks ago, and her daughters took up a regular labor with me to make me abandon the dress. They said they would not go into the street with me, end quote. Susan B. Anthony replied in agitation, quote, If Lucy Stone, with all of her powers and eloquence, her loveliness of character, who wins all that hear the sound of her voice, cannot bear the martyrdom of the dress, who can? Mrs. Stanton's parting words were, Let the hem out of your dress today, before tomorrow's meeting. I have not obeyed her, but have been in the streets and printing offices all day and have had rude vulgar men stare at me out of the countenance, oh, sorry, out of countenance and heard them say I opened the door. There come, sorry, heard them say as I opened the door, there comes my bloomer. Oh, hated name. I am known only as one of the women who ape men, coarse, brutal men. Oh, I cannot, I cannot bear it any longer, end quote. The failure of the bloomer movement can be laid at many doors. Mrs. Stanton conceded years later that pantaloons under a knee-length skirt were quote-unquote not artistic, and Mrs. Bloomer ruefully acknowledged that the new ideas in women's fashion did not arise from reformist journals, but from the romantic fantasies draped and sewn for the emperor's ladies in France. Among the denizens of the water cure resorts and the partisans of the improved spelling, the rational dress had its devoted champions. They tried to rename it the American costume, but these women were on the fringe, determinedly unfashionable, and the suffragists needed to win the hearts and minds of the nation. Where the suffragists saw a short skirt and a modest leg covering that allowed them to move with ease and freedom they had never known, others saw only a pair of obtrusive pants that confirmed their worst fears, that suffragists were women who really wanted to be men. In Victorian England, where femininity was enshrined in ribbons and bonnets and Alençon lace, reform-minded women also reformed a rational dress society to press for divide a divided skirt. But the real dilemma lay with a group of working-class heroines who fought desperately from 1850 to 1877 to remain in trousers, for their livelihood depended on rugged clothes. These were the colliery workers of Lancashire, Wigan, Birmingham, and South Wales, the hardy pit brow la lasses and mine tipped girls who sifted and loaded the coal after men brought it up to the surface. The women had already been banned from working the mine shafts and tunnels. Dress dressed in trousers, clogs, and sacking aprons, the coal haulers labored in 12 hour shifts, and by all accounts, they were fiercely proud of their grimy independence. Newspaper exposes and government sub commissions periodically deplored the colliery women in their quote-unquote disgusting habillement, and repel repeated efforts were made to oust them from the mines 
on the pious ground that their work clothes rendered them quote-unquote unsexed and degraded. History is enlivened by a number of women of ambition and talent who chose to masquerade in men's clothes or who wore some essential part of the forbidden costume in order to work in comfort. Whether it was to take up arms and fight for her country, like Joan of Arc, to lead escaped slaves through southern swamps to freedom, like Harriet Tubman, or to carouse at night in a rayfish cafes for, search, for research and adventure, like George Sand, a bonnet and skirt would have imposed a ridiculous bar. They are a mixed bunch, these purposeful cross-dressers, these illustrious women in serious drag, having little in common beside a profound need for self-realization and unstoppable courage. This list includes Rosa Bonheur, who received official permission from the Paris police to dress in men's clothes when she went to sketch horses at the slaughterhouse. Calamity Jane, who drove a stage close coach in the American West, and the eminent landscape designer Gertrude Jekyll, who wore army boots and a workman's apron to supervise the planting on England's great estates. No woman was more stubborn in her refusal to bow to the conventions of feminine dress than Joan of Arc, and no woman in history paid a higher price. In the glorious days of her triumph, the maid had exchanged her peasant reds for a page's costume of grey and black. Her pride was a suit of shining white armour for leading her troop into battle. After her capture, Joan of Arc was besieged by her jailers to put on a gown, but she would not comply. Her voices had not told her that her mission was over, and besides, it was safer to dress as a soldier in a prison administered by men. Joan's inquisitors pondered obsessively on her masculine attire. Receiving the sacrament while dressed like a man was one of the crimes with which she was charged. A woman's gown was brought to her cell after she broke down and made her sworn confession. Joan put it on, then took it off. God's soldiers could not bear the humiliation. Her relapse into masculine clothing seated her fate, for this was proof that her mind had not submitted. Joan was taken to the stake and burned in a skirt and bodice, an additional triumph for her captors. Spinsters, lesbians, bisexuals, women of ambiguous, androgynous sexual persuasions, decadent show-offs and publicity hounds, artists and actresses playing with roles, the divine Sarah Bern Bernhardt posed in a jacket, foulard, and trousers when she announced her intention to give up the stage and devote her life to sculpture. What did it signify when the rebellious actress and writer Fanny Kemble opposed, quote, to tight stays, tight garters, tight shoes, tight waistbands, tight armholes, and tight bodices, end quote, put on a vest and breeches to spend the afternoon with a woman friend? When Colette grinned rakishly for the camera in a stylish man's suit, a cigarette burning between her fingers, was this not the time between husbands when she was conducting her outrageous affair with the very mannish Missy? We know from her diary that Vita Sackville West disguised herself as a boy, running and jumping and vaulting over gates, quote, in the unaccustomed freedom of breeches and gaiters, end quote, when she was madly in love with a seductive violet. What celebrated achievement or dazzling beauty can be added to the visual effect the world smiles more kindly on women who dress in men's clothes? Even with Natalie Barney's lesbian circle in Paris between the wars, the stylish grace of actress Renee Vivian and Romaine Brooks. The artist, when they dress in high drag, set them apart from the friends who were less physically blessed and less notably accomplished. Una, Lady Tr Truebridge, in her monocle and cravat, and Lady Radcliffe, sorry, and Radcliffe Hall, with her ill-fitting suits and labored writing. Deborah Sampson Gannett, who dressed as a boy and soldiered in the American Revolution, would be more acceptable would be a more acceptable role model if she had saved a platoon or captured a city. Dame Ethel Smythe, the British composer and champion of suffrage, might have worn her swallow swallowtail coat to better effect if her figure were less stocky and her music more tuneful. And to bring matters up to date, the Annie Hall look that Diane Keaton created for the movie of the same name 
proved not so easy to pull off when women less winsome than Keaton affected the slouch hat, vest, and baggy pants. This much can be said. Some women have worn men's clothes to accomplish their work. Some women have worn men's clothes to indicate their temporary or permanent sexual attraction to other women. Some women have worn men's clothes to experience the power and freedom of being a man. Some women have worn men's clothes because they hated their female bodies. Some women have worn men's clothes because they looked so adorable in them. Some women have worn men's clothes because they sought an alternative to the confining clothes they were expected to wear and expected to delight in as women. Orlando, Virginia Woolf's novel of 1928, may be read not as a witty story of a woman who undergoes a change of sex, but as a metaphorical essay about a woman who undergoes a change of clothes. The book is dedicated to V. Sack Sackville West. Note. Wolf's autobiographical pieces, published for the first time in 1976, reveal a woman who felt terror when buying a new dress, from quote-unquote looking glass shame in the fitting room to self-consciousness and dread when she finally wore it. Miss Virginia Steffen had come from a family of famous beauties. Within the rules of Victorian manners, she and her sisters followed, quote, during daylight one could wear overalls, work, end quote, but in the evening in her father's drawing room, quote, a hair, sorry, dress and hair doing became far more important than pictures and Greek, end quote. End note. In the 1930s and 40s, Hollywood accomplished what the earnest movements for dress reform and individualistic rebels had never been able to manage, an acceptable image, one that men sound, found sexy, of a glamorous, vulnerable, patently heterosexual, sophisticated lady in slacks. As the glamorous ballroom dancer Irene Castle had feminized and popularized short hair in the 1920s, the frail figure, plucked eyebrows, heavy mascara, bright red lipstick, platinum hair, and high-heeled shoes of Marlene Dietrich feminized and made palatable the threatening image of a woman in a man-tailored jacket and trousers. Dietrich on screen and Garbo, Hepburn, and Bankhead off-screen were photographed repeatedly in pants, as was America's first androgynous sex symbol, the high-flying aviator Amelia Earhart, oh Amelia, wearing a brown leather flight jacket and grinning shyly from the cockpit of her new airplane, she appears to soar high in androgynous freedom. Of course, Earhart would be an appealing heroine, with her easy good looks and mysterious death. Not like the dour, unstylish Susan B. Anthony, or the brilliant George Eliot, with her lace-trimmed blouse and her Kirk's corkscrew curls preposterously framing her formly, her homely, strong face. But it is Dietrich's image, and not Earhart's or Keaton's, that permits the fashionable young woman of today to wear her fly-front trousers. As long as she gussies them up with high heels, painted fingernails, done hair, plenty of jewelry and makeup, her femininity will not be challenged. Compensatory femininity extracts its due in the form of fancy embellishments to modify the suspect, the suspect masculine model. This is known in the trade as the softening effect, an interesting phrase since there is nothing soft about spiked heels and long red fingernails, except that they reduce functionalism, hint at masochism, and alter the natural um, normal motion of the sophisticated lady in pants. Heterosexualizing effect would be more accurate a more accurate description, and what a sad commentary it makes on the tenuous relationship between the sexes that a woman must resort to a string of intricate deceptions in order to prove her heterosexual goodwill. Winter and summer, touches of nudity, are another proof of feminine expression. In its chic to bear the skin, sorry, it is chic to bear the skin, to play the tease, however unwittingly, between the concealed and exposed. A reluctance to show a thigh or reveal a midriff is considered a prudish timidity, old-fashioned dullness, and a lack of confidence, or else it is circumstantial evidence of flaw, thick legs, flabby skin, a hideous deforming scar. I am sympathetic to the argument that a woman should be free to wear what she wants without moral judgment or accusations of inviting assault. No study has ever shown that rapists seek out those who are provocatively dressed. Yet I am not unmindful that the argument usually comes from a very young woman in the happy phase of exploring fashion with a pioneering spirit and who look ahead to new frontiers. 
Those who resent gratuitous nudity are usually older, at an age where the flesh is less firm and attitude less liberal. Because older women are placed automatically on the losing side of the competition to look sexually appealing, they are in possession of knowledge that escapes the young and the physically blessed. Exposure of flesh is not a mere matter of style, insouciance, or modernity. It is a contest by which women are judged. It is inevitable that the movement for dress reform should have passed so blithely. Oh my god. Was it inevitable that the movement for dress reform should have passed so blithely from the battle against restrictive clothing to a glamorous rivalry of how much nudity could be revealed? Erotic attire has often served as a smokescreen to deflect female consciousness from a lasting understanding of the nature of oppression. The décolleté ball gowns of the rich and the peekaboo costumes of the whores historically shocked the industrious, good-fearing, sorry, God-fearing poor with their prideful displays of pampered flesh. Mrs. Grundy may have been a stereotype of conservative bourgeois values, but she was created by men of the bourgeoisie who wished to escape their own background. Her opposite number, the liberated woman, is assumed to be a femme fatale in scanty scanty dress. It is not accidental that as soon as women were freed from tight corsets and heavy hampering clothes, they were heartily encouraged to express their feminine difference in terms of exposure, for exposure was always the issue of the moral as the moralists saw it. Decency was thought to reside in the length of the hemline, or more coyly, in the lace hanky stuffed into the cleavage. So, if Susan Langlin made tennis headlines in 1919 when she appeared on a court in a mid-calf dress and long stockings, and if Alif Alice Marble shocked Wimbledon in 1933 by playing bare-legged in, in shorts under an unbuttoned tunic, there is logic of a sort in the hullabaloo of 1948 over the famous lace panties of gorgeous Gussie Morin. Gorgeous Gussie, I suspect, was only trying to feminize a practical and consequently sexless costume. But no matter. The right to move freely has always been to a dangerously unfeminine issue. The right to be titillating was greater, has greater appeal. Veils are a worldwide symbol of mysterious feminine sexuality, presumably because they conceal some frank aspect of women's appearance. As popular wisdom has it, the erotic life of the veil resides in the imagined beauty of the hidden face, yet a person with any sense of history must know that even when the slot for the eyes is richly embroidered, the veil is a shroud of silence, anonymity, and restriction that is used to keep women secluded from the active world of men. Efforts in Muslim countries to throw off the veil meet with a frightened amount of resistance from men who howl about the destruction of their traditional values. In Afghanistan, the proposed unveiling of women by a Marxist government was one threatening factor that inspired the revolt of fundamentalist rebels. The return of women to the Chador was one of many disturbing aspects of the Islamic nationalism promoted by Ayatollah Khomeini's regime in Iran. Taking the veil remains the customary expression of Christianity to describe a woman's act of renouncing the temporal world and a sexual life to enter a convent. Whatever their religion, women in veils are mummified, are a mummified caste whose sexuality is hidden so it cannot threaten the social order of men. By the sentimental tradition, the act of unveiling the bride at the close of the wedding ceremony announces the lawful permission to deflower the virgin without, sorry, within the sanctified union of marriage. As the bride wears a veil of white, the widow once shrouded herself in veils of black to signify, among other things, the passing of the active phase of her sexual existence. Devised as a feminine cloak of moral virtue and protected status, the veil also imparts a message of intrigue and illicit sex. 
swathed in heavy veiling in order to visit her clandestine lover, the adulterous woman in the 19th centuries, m- century might view her disguise as a titillating prelude to the, inor- to the amorous assignation, and so might her lover. The veil is perceived as erotic when sexual guilt is perceived as erotic. Favored by milliners of the 20th century to give a frou-frou t- touch to their original creations, the peak of veil on a fanciful hat became a glamorous artifact, artifact of submission, ambiguous, unam- oh gosh, artifact of submission, ambiguously ladylike and provocative in its vestigial drape of black net. At this particular moment in history, when the ratios of sexual preference seem to have gone awry and a vast number of homosexual men and straight single women are roaming the range in search of love, sex, and meaningful relations, it is obvious that these two groups dress up to enhance their sexual attraction, while lesbian women and heterosexual men dress more carelessly or to conceal their bodies, having no urgent need to attract the judgmental male eye. Intense concern for appearance in the gay male culture, working out, keeping thin, looking young, wearing strategic, form-fitting clothes, may be evidence of an aesthetic sensibility, but the sensibility is an all-out effort to win the sexual interest of other men. The circumstance lends credence to the point of view that women do not dress for other women, except to show off their stuff competitively, and furthermore, that quote-unquote homosexual designers cannot be blamed for the uncomfortable, unrealistic fusion they foist upon women. For the whole show is produced for the approval of heterosexual men. Many gay men, as straight women often observe, are very attractive. There's a lot to be said for tight pants on a good body in excellent condition. However, the, el- the effort is seldom made on our behalf, except by a handful of rock stars and movie actors who absorb themselves in this colorful, sensual manner. The word is narcissistic, because appearance and audience play a crucial role in how they earn a living. Most straight men do not need to rely on sexual plumage, either to earn a living or to entice a woman, and a masculine tradition of the last two centuries has taught that sexualizing clothing on a man is undignified and foppish. Men of action and power are colorless by choice, it would seem, when their status is unchallenged and secure. Only those most likely to be ignored or discounted or who possess a special need to be noticed, a broad category that might include women, blacks, gay men, short men, men on the make, and entertainers, are demonstrably more colorful and fashion conscious. Gays, nevertheless, have had a marked effect on men's fashion, chiefly because the new emphasis on slimline jackets and close-fitting pants has reopened the question of pocketbooks and pockets. Women's clothes are rarely designed with functional pockets. The 19th century feminist Charlotte Perkins Gilman wrote passionately about this. Because the necessary object a real pocket might be expected to hold, money, keys, comb, eyeglasses, pen, and all the feminine etc., would spoil the graceful, smooth line. Influenced in part by European designers, a pioneering number of American men have persuaded themselves that it might not be too great a blow to their own masculinity if they carried a shoulder strap bag. Not a clutch or a handbag, that would be too feminine and inconvenient, but a neat, tailored carry-all that is flat and unobtrusive. Perhaps the day may arrive when the pocketbook ceases to be a feminine symbol. How will the Freudians cope with that? Or perhaps this brave new accessory will prove too encumbering for the general masculine appeal. Realistically, it is harder to imagine legions of women without their pocketbooks, than legions of men with them, for men have a definitive biological advantage when it comes to stowing a pack of cigarettes and a wallet. An inside breast pocket, or an outside breast pocket for that matter, is no place for a woman to carry anything. If dolls are given to little girls to train them for motherhood, they also train little girls to become fashion consumers. Blissful hours spent dressing and undressing a Barbie doll with her wondrous costumes are preparation for little except department store and shopping malls, the dreamy, habit-forming world where the adult woman 
is encouraged to feast on the sensuality of texture, shape, and color, and bring into her life the romance and illusion she is expected to embody. A trench coat suffused with foreign intrigue, a negligee of satin and feathers for the romantic, candlelit evening, an après-ski suite, sorry, an après-ski suit, even if one doesn't ski. Shopping is indeed the woman's opiate, yet the economy would suffer a new crisis if the American woman dropped her feminine interest in clothes and ceased to be a conspicuous consumer. As far back as the Bible and the writings of the early Christians, women were denounced as prideful and whorish for indulging in the extravagance of fashion. Entire he-man industries, baleen whaling, fur trapping, and the like, were built on the woman's need to look feminine and appealing. And yet, when the fashion peaked or the supply was exhausted, the conceit of womanhood was blamed. Women were blamed for the annihilation of whales to make stays for their corsets. Women were blamed for the near extinction of egrets to put feathers in their hats. Women were blamed for the miserable conditions of the Belgian lace makers and the Japanese silkworm workers. And women are blamed today for the murder of baby seals and rare leopards. Yet the point of all of it was usually to please a man. For it accrued to his success that his woman was arrayed in such majestic finery. Few women today are in a position to exempt themselves from productive labor, but none of us is exempt from a, a standard of feminine dressing that still includes evidence of conspicuous consumption. A hardworking woman who pays her own bills now puts aside some money or sets up a charge account to treat herself to the fur coat or piece of jewelry that a husband or lover might have bestowed on her in an earlier age. Lillian Hellman poses in The New Yorker for Black Lima Mink and Lauren Bacall exhibits the gold bracelets and diamonds she bought for herself in, fifth, in a Fifth Avenue store. Are these superficial values or an enviable example of American success a tribute to the, financial independent, the financially independent woman? Probably neither. So long as society measures a woman's status by the evidence of luxury on her person, no individual woman may be faulted or applauded for her hankering after jewelry and fur, but neither will be understood automatically that her neither will it be understood automatically that her finery and was hard won by her honest labor. A woman quote unquote dripping in fur is still perceived as a woman who has acquired an expensive gift, and the credit is thought to reside with her devoted, successful husband or in her liberally bestowed sexual flavors. The sobble and the mink are known to breed a masculine fantasy, the desire to make mad, passionate love to a naked woman wrapped loosely in fur. Indeed, a fur coat 
possesses a sexual aura that is not entirely the product of its warmth or luxuriant softness. There is a history to women in fur. Mistresses opening the gaily wrapped gift box and squeals of joy. Take back your mink, fluffy white bear throws and tiger skin rugs, chorus girls and st stage door and stage door johnnies. Quote, I'd rather sin with Eleanor Glynn on a tiger skin than air with her on any other fur, end quote. And there is even a pornographic classic, Venus in Fur, by Masuk of sadomasochistic fame. There is, as well, a moral probity attached to not wearing fur. Accused of financial wrongdoing in his 1952 vice presidential campaign, Richard Nixon asserted the nation in his checkers speech that his wife Pat wore, quote-unquote, a good Republican cloth coat. Like the religious moralists before them, new left radicals of the 60s used to be expensively used the expensively dressed woman as a hatred symbol of selfish disregard for the ills of the world. What one chooses to wear may well be an indication of economic status, class aspirations, and political and moral values. But the women's situation is doubly complicated by the feminine goal of appearing expensive, frivolous, sexy, vulnerable, and refined in one package. Some women of the old left doggedly wore their fur coats at demonstrations in the 60s against the Vietnam War because they wanted to show a doubting nation that the peace movement was filled with people of substance. A decade later, at the end of the political spectrum, at the other end of the political spectrum, fascinating womanhood groups encouraged their members to surprise and delight their husbands when they came home for supper dressed up like floozies. Whatever a woman puts on, it is likely to be a costume, whether it is fur, white lace, a denim skirt, or black leather pants. Serious women have a difficult time with clothing, not necessarily because they lack a developed sense of style, but because feminine clothes are not designed to project a serious demeanor. Part of the reason many people find old photographs of parading suffragettes so funny is that their elaborate dresses seem at odds with the marching in unison down the street. Team spirit has always relied on a uniform dress code for maximum effect, as generals and bohemians well know. Despite the proliferation of, of advice manuals on what the up-and-coming young female executive should wear to the office, dressing feminine remains incompatible with looking corporate, credible, and competent, and no Dress for Success book has been able to resolve the inherent contradictions or provide the extra time and money that maintaining a feminine wardrobe requires. Men resigned themselves to a lack of individuality in clothes a long time ago, but women still hold out hope for clothes that are comfortable, feminine, and appropriate for work in one all-purpose outfit. Major airlines periodically commission top designers to perform this feat for their flight attendants with mixed and often peculiar results. The U.S. Army has yet to resolve the weighty matter of the right kind of shoe for its female recruits. In traditional, sorry, in tradition-minded occupations where women are breaking employment bars, an appropriate dress code seems particularly elusive. How should a woman dress for her job in a symphony orchestra where the men perform in regulation black tuxedos? At one concert I attended, the flautist wore a floor-length black skirt, the violinist wore a knee-length black skirt, and the cellist opted for black trousers. They managed to play harmoniously, and that was important. In corporate law and finance, two conservative fields where ambitious women have established a tenuous foothold, the conventional uniform for the new female executive is the full color jacket and matching knee-length skirt, suggesting a gentlemanly aspect on the top and a ladylike aspect down below. Pants are not worn except by occasional the occasional secretary, for they lack an established tradition, and their bright colors do not signal efficiency, responsibility, and steadiness on the job. Calling attention to the breasts by wearing a sweater or a silk shirt without a jacket is unprofessional on the executive level, especially since men persist in wearing regulation suit jackets to show their gentlemanly status. Few think it odd that the brave new careerist must obscure her breasts and display her legs in order to prove she can function in a masculine world, and yet, retain some familiar, comforting aspect of the feminine difference. Tradition in clothes 
may well outlast tradition and occupation. When Sandra Day O'Connor was sworn in as the first woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court, there was no mistake which one she was in the formal group picture. Eight smiling justices wore trousers and long black judicial robes that came to the ankles, and one smiling justice wore a specially hemmed robe that came to the knees. Justice O'Connor was the one in nylon stockings. <laughs>